make certain things work well. And knowing that that's the case, uh, we're going to step through a number of those items as we go. So uh, I, I have had the good fortune of being inducted in the Accounting Hall of Fame in uh, February of 2011. I've been on the Accounting Today Top 100 Most Influential for 10 years running. I've uh, been a top 25 thought leader uh, since that organization was started in 2011. Uh, I've been around technology for a long time, 40 plus years of doing technical implementations and so forth, 50 plus years of actual experience. Uh, I write articles pretty regularly, you've probably seen me in some of those, and have spoken on the circuit for 30 plus years. My contact information is here if you'd like to send me direct questions, I try to answer email pretty much within 24 hours. But I also, uh, I'll say started a policy four years ago that I don't do a presentation where I don't show pictures of the grandchildren. This is my first day back from vacation, so I'll be a little uh, hesitant in some of my speech, just like you saw there as I'm getting kind of in the swing again. But we got to spend time with all four grandchildren and all of my four children and their spouses, so it was very uh, good time. And I hope you get to spend some time with your family uh, uh, throughout the summer and throughout the rest of the year. I am the owner of Network Management Group, which does uh, infrastructure work and websites uh, coast to coast. We've done uh, 24 by 7 CPA firm support for uh, quite a number of years. And I also own K2 uh, Enterprises, which produces about 1,100 events to about 60,000 accounts in the U.S. and Canada. And I mentioned the two organizations because there's uh, 25 and 30 people uh, respectively in those organizations. A lot of the information that we're talking uh, about is going to uh, roll up from the experience of those people. So uh, knowing that that's the case, we also have uh, CPE support sites at K2E, uh, CPA Firm Tech, Accounting Software World, and totallypaperless.com. If you visit uh, k2e.com, you should be able to see the uh, links to all of the other sites. And it sounds like a, a number of you are having trouble hearing me. Uh, at least I've seen about a half a dozen indications like that. So Div, uh, Sharon, how would you like me to adjust? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm actually not having trouble hearing you, but we can, um, let me see here. All right, let me just uh, back up a little bit and let's see if, uh, you know, we uh, have any issue because, you know, it may be that I'm so close to the mic, I was trying to make sure I was hitting the mic squarely that everybody could hear. We'll see how this runs and we'll kind of watch uh, what happens from here. All right? All right, thanks. So, you know, during this time then we're going to go through hardware and software technologies and we're going to try to give you very direct guidance on what's out there, what you should choose, and so forth. And uh, hopefully from the downloaded materials, you'll be able to use this as a reference point. So we're going to talk about the right workstations and mice and keyboards and monitors and how to make your computers work better. Again, very, very practical approach to the uh, um, content. It's really been a few years since we covered very fundamental technologies and a number of you as you've attended our events around the country asked for that. So what we're specifying are things that we know to be reliable and safe choices when implemented correctly. They work as we speak about them. And I maintain a number of these also at our technology uh, best practices website as another reference point. So let's start with something uh, somewhat fundamental, surge protection. First, I'd like for you to know that if you use American power surge protectors, which many of you do, that there was a complete recall of all products manufactured from 1993 through 2002 because of fire hazard. So you can look at the link that I've included, recall.apc.com slash en, and that'll let you know what the recall uh, methodology should be. Uh, please eliminate these old surge protections from your homes and businesses because they will in fact catch fire and uh, they get replaced with new generation products including the Pro 8T2 and Pro 7 and Pro 7T which are the surge protectors of choice in our opinion right now. Most of these surge protectors run about $20. So if you're doing UPSs however we don't recommend APC. We think you're much better off with Eaton or Liebert because of the interface capabilities of the UPSs. And this is true at both the server and the desktop level. So for a number of you, that could be a uh, pretty straightforward recommendation. 
I've got about five or six slides here talking about keyboards and mice. Um, the key thing to remember is if you buy a new computer, it doesn't matter who the vendor is, HP, Lenovo, Dell, doesn't matter. Throw the bloody keyboards away that come with these pieces of equipment. They're cheap, they're counterproductive, and I would say just in general that you've got to make sure that you get a high quality keyboard. So um, the Logitech G15 is an example of these keyboards. Uh, a product that I like very much is the uh, K800. That is, in fact, what I'm personally using to run this uh, particular webinar. And you can see that's about a $70 keyboard. In uh, reviews and by Logitech's claims, they consider this the most ergonomic keyboard created to date. So maybe, may not be, but it's a good value and a good keyboard, which I like very much. There are also other ergonomic keyboards available, like the MK550 in their line, or like the uh, Solar keyboard, which can be used on Macs and iPads and iPhones, certainly an option or the Microsoft Sculpt ergonomic keyboard. Again, what I'm trying to do is just giving you an idea of some of the keyboards that are out there. As you can see, you're going to spend between about $50 to maybe on the high side $130, but for about $70 you can get a good, solid, productive keyboard. And we have the same issue, in my opinion, around mice. Um, don't really care on the vendor. I happen to use the Logitech brand here because I like the way these products work. And the key thing I'd like for you to note is down here in the lower right hand corner, this Logitech Unifying Receiver is a pretty big deal as I see it. There are lots of mice in the Logitech line that talk to the Unifying Receiver, including my favorite mouse right now, which is this Performance Mouse, which is also what I'm using to run the presentation. You can see it's a $75 mouse, but darn well worth it. Again, I'm looking at trading a little bit of hardware dollars for increased productivity at the user level. Uh, for portable purposes, I use the Anywhere mouse, which I don't have in this list. But if you uh, look at products that use the unifying adapter or receiver, you can hook up to five peripherals. One of the key things we learned in the past year or so is that it's perfectly good to hook two keyboards to a single system. And yeah, you heard that right. In the old days, 98, we started recommending uh, multiple monitors. Well, this past year, we saw a purpose to recommend multiple keyboards or multiple mice. So you might consider that as an alternative. In my case, I run the same keyboard and mice on my home system, so I don't have to do anything with the unifying receiver in place. I just plug and unplug my systems, and they all work. So you might look at some of the touch-related mice, like the T630 in the lower left-hand side, or the T650 pad as well. Uh, the highest precision mice that we're aware of right now is that G500 gaming mouse. Again, I'm not trying to get you necessarily to pick a Logitech mouse. I just want you to get a good high-performance mouse, and these were some examples. One final thing on mice that I'd point out uh, is that you need to load the software that comes with the mice. If it's Logitech, load the set point. If it's Microsoft, use the IntelliSense mouse software. It helps give you more of the controls of the mice to do things a little easier. Uh, page redraws, advance and backwards, and some things like that. The reason you might use multiple keyboards or mice is if your office is set up in such a way that you've got a, a L-shaped return, or you uh, maybe work away from your desk, uh, facing, let's say, uh, backwards or forwards, you can have a, a set of mice and keyboards in the alternate position. You don't have to pick up your mice or keyboard and move them. So if you find yourself picking up mice and keyboards right now, you're a candidate for multiple mice or uh, keyboards themselves. All right, next up, um, the printer recommendations are pretty straightforward. We still believe that HP is among your better options. So I gave a LaserJet example, the Color M451NW. 
Uh, this particular color laser is only about $300 and it's fairly high performance, but you can look at black laser jets and, and see similar type of price performance. We don't recommend desk jets in general, that's the inkjet family of printers because of their cost of operation. But for homes or very light use or where you've got photo printing needs, they're probably fine. Uh, you can use all-in-one copiers, but you need to watch um, your contracts. For example, Xerox or Canon or IBM and a bunch of other vendors we could name here. But in the contracts, the vendors often charge you a per-click charge, or if you're using them as scanners, a per-click charge. So just make sure that if you're going to print to a copier, that your cost per page is reasonable. To come out of a black laser jet right now, it's pretty common to get your cost per page down in the point two to point one cent per page range. And most of the copier contracts we've seen are between point five, usually point seven, and sometimes one point five cents a page. So to me, this is partially a uh, throughput and partially a cost issues. There's other vendors I like just fine, for example, Lexmark, but you have to watch by your geography uh, where the service is done well and where it's not and pretty much universally around the country, you're going to get good service in the HP LaserJet line. Other vendors will probably be a little more spotty. In terms of scanners, uh, there's multiple interfaces that are available. We recommend that you consider using TWAIN, technology without an interesting name is what that acronym stands for. And you should avoid some of the uh, other interfaces, for example, ISIS, Industry Standard Interface Specification, or WIA, Windows Interface Architecture, and so forth. We think it's better to avoid the, those types of interfaces and any proprietary interfaces because Twain is directly compatible with software. So examples, if you're using products like LACERT Tax or you're using things like CCH Engagement, you can drop scanned documents directly into the applications themselves. So in general, you're going to have the ability to use products without extra steps. And that's the reason for uh, asking about that or, or mentioning that. Now we believe for most of you, you should use production scanners, not personal scanners. There's some very nifty personal scanners out there like the Doxy. But in this particular uh, case, I'm going to suggest that you, uh, you know, look at the production class boxes and you can use some cloud options. Let's look at a few of these. So, for example, notice that the Fujitsu production quality line we've recommended for quite some time. There is a product called the uh, Fujitsu 6140Z. It's a very fast scanner. It's 60 pages a minute and uh, routinely right now can be purchased on the street for about $700. There are less expensive models in this family, the 6130Z for example, that's routinely coming in in more of the $400 ballpark. But Fujitsu is just now entering a new product line or releasing a new product line just like their competitor Canon is doing it. It's the first time in probably five years we've seen notable hardware replacements at the scanner level. So the product I have you watch for is the Fujitsu uh, FI7160. Again, about a $700 street price, uh, 80 pages a minute, so 20 page minutes faster, really super paper handling capability, and it has image cleanup tools like Kofax and uh, batch scanning utilities like their Scan All Pro. It, it includes uh, PDF editing, uh, capabilities with the Adobe product, and then there are uh, actually specific things that you may need to do based on your provider of software, and providers will have certain settings that they want you to use with these products. You'll notice we don't specifically name the scan snap here because it's a personal quality scanner, a very good scanner, but even in the most current versions, the iX500, it doesn't support Twain, nor will it ever support Twain. So you wind up doing extra steps. And for the uh, small difference in price, by the way, the iX500 is typically street pricing in the 4 450 range, we think the, the money differential comes back 
very quickly because of eliminating the extra steps for professionals. Now, when you look at the whole uh, Fujitsu lineup, you know, again, there's a pretty broad lineup here. I'm going to go ahead and paint in most of the images. And you'll see that there's not only the uh, Fujitsu scan snaps uh, in these lineups, but also some additional products that are much higher end that are very, very quick. And you can see that the price of scanners can run from a few hundred dollars at the low end to 25000 ish or so on the high end. What we're trying to get you to do is pick a scanner that's very high speed, that can be shared by a work group, that's kind of in the $700 to $1,100 ballpark. We think that's a pretty good strategy. Now, other vendors make very good scanners. In fact, I noted today a new release from Canon on a model called the 6110 Mod 2. Uh, and it looked like a good enough scanner that I'll probably change uh, this slide to support that new release that came out today. But one model in particular that I'd like you to be aware of is the uh, Image Formula P215 with an additional option called a Scantini. Now this P215 is a very small scanner. It's as small as the smallest of the uh, Fujitsu scan snaps like the uh, 1300 family. And this product has Twain, another big benefit, plus it sells for about $250 retail making it the least expensive Twain scanner in the market. Now if you add Scantini, Scantini is a wireless sharing of the scanner. So if you have audit teams or mobile workers in the field and you want to share one scanner, you can add a Scantini to get that job done. There are individual desktop scanners like the C130 or the traditional model here like the 6030 are all good examples of Canon scanners. Now when you download the materials, uh, these links, like this scanner link, these were designed to be live to drop exactly into the website about the products that we're talking about. So hopefully the PDF that you get of this webinar gets that job done for you. So I noticed some of you had asked if you missed a polling question. I don't think so. We're at polling question number one. Div to you. All right, great. Thank you, Randy. Um, so at this point, we will go ahead and put in the first poll question here. And you should see it launch in just a moment. So our first poll question is, how do you typically share documents with your clients? And there are five options there. Please note that <clears throat> completing all three poll questions is required if you would like to receive CP. So we're seeing responses come in here at this point. And we'll keep the poll open for about 10 to 15 more seconds here to allow people to finish polling. I, and by the way, there is no submit key. You simply have to select which option uh, you would prefer. Yeah, so as Divs pointed out, make sure that you get your response in because if you need the CPE credit, we'd like for you to get it and you have to answer this question to do so. All right, so I'm going to go ahead at this point and close this poll right here. And uh, Randy, I'm not sure if you can see the results, but 36% of people said that they email a password protected file. Um, and then about an equal number said mail printed copies, arrange in-house pickup, and through an online client portal. So Div, before you uh, close that, uh, if you could leave that up for just a minute. Just for the record, uh, folks, emailing a password protected file is actually not a safe methodology. And I realize many of you do that for convenience of your clients and so forth. Uh, so for, for those of you that are doing that, I'd sure like you to consider doing a portal. Uh, that's a much better methodology. And you know, obviously the mail printed copies and arrange in-house pickup, clearly manual methods uh, and so forth. But just for what it's worth, be cautious because that email password protected isn't protecting the documents the way you might think. All right. So, Div, I think if you're done, we can take it back this way. Sounds good. I've just transferred back to you. All right. And actually, Div, it did not come back this way yet. Uh, let me just try that again. Okay. 
There she goes. And can you see my screen, which now says mobile? Yes. All right, super. So now many of you use mobile computing and uh, smartphones. I think it, for the record, it's probably helpful for you to know that the iPhone is only six years old and the iPad only four years old. So we're still very, very early on in all this mobile technology. Of course, I, uh, Apple has been having their developers conference this week and introduced the new iOS 8, which you know I've gone through the features there and so forth. And we'll probably see the new iPhone 6 in September, October. For now, though, our preferred uh, mobile cell phones are listed here. In the Apple world, the iPhone 5S. Uh, in the Samsung world, the Galaxy S5. Uh, we like the HTC 8X and 1 and the Moto X. Uh, and also the Nokia Lumia Icon, the 929, as well as the uh, 1041s and a few other models in their product lines. For your tablets, iPad Airs or Minis are probably a call here. We like the Nexus product from Google. Uh, the Galaxy Tab 3 is just out. And of course, Microsoft Surface 3, Pro 3, has just been announced and should be available next week. So if you really want Windows compatibility on a portable unit, the Surface Pro 2 has worked fine. We think the Pro 3 promises to work even better with the HD format screen. So again, we think those are just some simple choices that you can make. There's lots and lots of choices, probably 100 tablets, and I can't even tell you how many cell phones in the market. But this is a pretty good uh, list of current products. So when you start thinking about what's going on with smartphones, understand that 64-bit you know, computing is becoming uh, normal, and we're starting to see a lot of Windows 8 phones gaining market share. Uh, during the past, uh, let's say, six months, iPhone US market share has been declining, and Samsung and Windows market shares have both been increasing. iPhone is still the dominant product in about the 44% range, and Samsung at about 31%. Uh, and then Windows is north of 10 at this point. So there's quite a bit of change going on in the smartphone market. But one of the more notable changes is larger phones. I've seen a number of these big phones. And the Nokia Lumia 1520, which I did not name earlier, is shown here next to the 928. The, the, the phone is massive. I've got some of my K2 team carrying this. It's, it's like a combination phone and tablet. And we see that with other products like the Samsung Note. And I've talked to a number of Note users in the past week, asking them how they like it. And man, the response was more enthusiastic than I get from my iPhone and iPad users. So, consider that as a single device solution if the large device size works for you. But one of the things that we know is happening, and we think you may not be planning your IT budgets this way, is tablets and phones last for less time than computers. We generally are recommending that phones and tablets have a projected life of no more than about two years. The reason for that is changes in wireless standards, changes in cellular standards, and so forth. And frankly, the batteries are pretty weak at the end of a two-year contract. So in general, if you're not budgeting to replace your cell phones and tablets on a pretty regular basis, you may be actually having some real performance issues in the last year or two of ownership. So much quicker obsolescence than we saw in the PC families. Next up, please, is just a few comments around hard drives and disks. It is clear to us that solid state drives, that's SSDs, solid state drives should be used by accounting professionals. And this is true at the server level, but it's also true in your desktops and your portable computers. SSDs come in three grades, server, business, and consumer, and we recommend you avoid consumer grade solid state drives. But even if you're running 100% in the cloud, the performance difference is notable enough to run off of a solid state. We think it's worth the money in both desktops and laptops. You can use network attached storage for personal and business purposes, but we think that that's very limited in usefulness. And we can talk more about why on that. But fundamentally, you're going to be better served, we think, by having storage area networks ISCSI or fiber channel, 
and using solid state drives if you're maintaining an in-house storage area network. Probably the three vendors of choice here, HP, Dell, and Cybernetics, fit more of you than, let's say, the big boys like NetApp or uh, EMC or I could name more. But be very careful if you're sizing storage area networks with the big boys like HP and Dell. They have sizing tools that undersized CPA firms. So you will almost certainly not have enough performance if you follow the HP and Dell guidelines. The other thing that we want to make sure you're thinking about is backup. We think the safest approach is to use a backup appliance. There's hundreds of these offerings in the U.S. marketplace, and we don't really have much of a preference other than one that we ask you to avoid. So, for example, I'll cite the NetRescue appliance, which is about $2,200 to have a machine that backs up your servers and desktops in the office, and then optionally can back up into the cloud or back up to another backup appliance. So if you're maintaining legacy in-house uh, systems, we think you should use a backup appliance. So the one uh, system that you should avoid based on its uh, bugginess right now is the Dell Aperture. Uh, Aperture seems to continue to have trouble with restoring files. Dell continues to sell it. But in my mind, a backup appliance that you can't restore files from is of no use at all. So just avoid that one product. Almost everybody else is, is working properly. So when you start looking at those, just be aware that this is a wonderful solution whether you're uh, using virtual servers or regular servers for backup purposes. So um, in terms of general recommendations, these are pretty straightforward recommendations to you. Uh, if you're buying new workstations for the desktop, we want no less than 8 gig of RAM this year, 16 might be better, and we'd prefer you run on i7 or i5 Intel Core i7 or i5 systems. Don't use the i3s, they're not fast enough if you're doing accounting work. Um, they, we recommend having a solid state, or maybe I'd be okay with a hybrid disk drive for the boot drive. And if you're running in the cloud, you don't need a big drive, 128 gig, plenty big. If you are going to use this for full-time processing, you might want to look at a bigger drive. 256 is probably enough, although 512s have come down enough in price that that's okay, too. Uh, many of the desktop systems today aren't shipping with a uh, CD or Blu-ray or any of that, so just be aware of that. And remember that VGA and DVI are disappearing quickly. Most systems, they're not available. What's being used today is predominantly HDMI or DisplayPort. Once in a while, you see a mini display port. So if you're using older VGA monitors, be aware that you might have to buy an adapter or you may have an incompatible desktop system when you make your purchase. Now, laptops, same deal as desktops, 8 to 16 gig of RAM, i5, i7s. We prefer you to consider uh, Ultrabooks, which are super thin yet powerful, uh, highly mobile computers. There's lots of these available. If you're working 100% in the cloud, you can use the Chromebook, and you'll see later in the year, Intel has introduced a, a bunch of new chips to improve Chromebook performance. If you're thinking about timing, Intel has also introduced some brand new processing chips that should be in the September and October models. Now, in terms of displays, uh, there's a movement to larger displays, and the reason for that is it uh, allows us to take less desk space and to have more open windows. So again, I was a proponent early on of multiple monitors, probably in 1998 when I said, let's start running two or three monitors. Today, you can run eight or 16 monitors quite easily, but realistically, do we want to? I think a better choice is to run a pair of 27s or a pair of 30-inch monitors, probably your best value Right now is Samsung monitors. Uh, second best value tends to be HP. Dell is probably third best, and LG is fourth. And those are you're probably the ones to look at in terms of quality and so forth. It turns out Windows 8 does a superb job of supporting multiple monitors on desktops or laptops. The launch toolbar can be customized by menu, and that's very helpful. 
if you need portable displays because you have field workers, uh, auditors that are on the road or salespeople that are on the road and so forth, and they need a, an additional monitor, again, consider an Ultrabook laptop and augment that with a, one of the four models that I've suggested in portable displays. The combination of the Ultrabook plus the portable display will be less expensive and lighter weight than the traditional laptops. So if you think about it, that's a pretty good deal. It's cheaper, it's faster, it's lighter weight, and you get two monitors if you're doing portable. So again, we want a pair of 27s because the, or a pair of 30s, because the desk space is less and you can run four windows instead of, let's say, three. Um, you know, one of the questions coming in from Charles is, what's the estimated life of a laptop? Uh, if you get a high quality laptop right now, we're suggesting three or four years. If you're getting consumer grade laptops, you'll be doing real well if they last that 18 months to two years that you're talking about, Charles. Uh, consumer grade laptops are only designed to run three hours per day. A business grade laptop is designed to run about 12 hours per day. So notice you can't run a laptop 24 by 7, they burn up too quickly. But if you've been getting consumer grade laptops and running them, you know, extended periods, let's say 12 or 18 hours a day, yeah, having them fail in 18 months or two years sounds pretty normal to me. So in any case, this, this idea of using bigger monitors and getting away from dual or triple in the 15 to 19 inch class is certainly a big change here. So, you know, when you come down to these larger class monitors, uh, there's a few other vendors you could look at, Planner, Panasonic, and LG, for example. We think touch screens make some sense here, but still too expensive for most of you to consider for full-time use. However, I will mention to you that I've already got more than one business, more than one firm, running everything in the firm on touch screens. All the desktops are touch screens. All of the laptops are touch screens and so forth. The software is catching up to make this all work better, and the price is clearly trending down on the touch screen uh, monitors. Uh, Disney, as well as uh, Sharp, have all introduced 3D touch screen monitors, which is a very fascinating thing. You can actually feel textures on the 3D uh, touch screens. And in some of your cases, having a lay flat or a sharply angled touchscreen monitor may be in your best interest, particularly if you wear bifocals or trifocals. Uh, many of the all-in-one computers have a touchscreen included. So for example, the Sony Biotap uh, 21 or the HP TouchSmart or Elite One 800 are examples of business-grade uh, machines that have this type of capabilities. In terms of your servers, if you're maintaining in-house servers, the three big uh, vendors, HP, IBM, Lenovo, and Dell, are um, the, the ones probably to stay with at this point. You should know that Lenovo has a, an offer to purchase the IBM server line. I think that will come through. Uh, this is the first year where we've recommended the Microsoft Data Center edition, a special version of their operating system that supports more CPUs. It's the most cost-effective way to, uh, to get that done now. And, um, there is a new Intel chip that was introduced in March called the Xeon E7 V2. Uh, it's a very important server processor chip change because we're seeing roughly double the performance with 30% less power used. We'll see these in the desktop and laptop chips again in that September, October timeframe. But if you're considering buying a new server right now, we'd like for you to watch for the Xeon E7 V2. It is worth more money to get the extra performance and the power savings as we see it. So, um, you know, I'm going to catch up on a couple of the questions because I see them coming down through here. Uh, you know, one of the questions was about 4K monitors for accounting. Dan, we think it's too early to use 4K monitors. I, I've played with them enough to know that that's probably not a good choice. Um, in terms of the USB 3.0 uh, replicator, uh, going to continue to recommend USB Link there. They have a really good uh, product to do that. A number of the vendors have uh, USB docking stations and USB Link has one of those. And um, in terms of the difference between a consumer and business grade product line, if you um, visit any of the three vendor sites, HP, 
Lenovo, Dell, they normally will call the home machines the consumer grade. So you need the ones that are labeled work. So for example, I was on both Dell and HP's site earlier today just checking a few facts for today's presentation and you want to get those uh, higher levels. So in the Dell, for example, you want to be up in the latitudes or the precisions. And in the HP's, you basically want to be in a, a, you know, their elite uh, series by and large. So in any case, if you're running servers, just make sure you virtualize. Use VMware. Hyper-V is not ready for prime time for most of you. IT professionals are trying to recommend that, and frankly, uh, I'm not sure that's a very good choice even yet. However, we do think Hyper-V, by the time we get through the end of 2014 and into 2015, will be a competitive uh, enough product to consider it at that point. And again, remember, we like solid states and boot ROMs and so forth in here. So um, virtualization is for real. Uh, frankly, it's what's made a lot of the cloud applications work, in our opinion. And of course, Accountants World, who's sponsoring the event, you know, they've been in the cloud for about 15 years. I, I believe it was 1999 when they entered. And that was very visionary at the time. We think most of you should look at some sort of virtualization, whether it's in-house private cloud or out-of-house public cloud. So it looks like we're about ready for our next polling question. So Div to you, please. Thank you, Randy. I uh, will go ahead and launch the second one. And so the question here is, how often do you access your office applications remotely? And we're starting to see votes come in. Remember that you must vote in all three polls in order to um, be eligible for CP, and I was actually told that many of you are seeing a submit button, so uh, that's great. In that case, please go ahead and click that to make sure that your responses are counted. And we'll give just a few more seconds here, and then we're going to close the poll. Okay, so Randy, here are the results. They should be coming up in just a second here. And so we're seeing 40% of people don't have or allow remote access, 33% access office applications remotely about once a week, and 25% do at least once a day. All right, and uh, you know, as I'm watching that uh, poll, I think it's fascinating. I haven't been in my office in months. I, I feel that way. I think this is my second business day in the office this year. But uh, in terms of remote access, we think it's a pretty important uh, technology, but we also completely understand those of you who might say, you know, if I'm going to work, I want to be in the office, and if I'm at home, I don't want to be working. I, I'm absolutely I'm very happy with that type of response. So we should, uh, I think, be seeing now a slide that says virtualization. Is that true, Dave? Yes, that's correct. All right, super. Just a few questions and we'll uh, go ahead. Rob, uh, the question, is it time to buy a Surface 3? I can't, in fact, answer the question, but I can tell you that I've got them on pre-order because we think the basic specification of the Surface 3 is, is a good enough that that will be a worthy machine to own. Uh, there was another question from Randy about, uh, you know, if you've got a three users, should you just stay with freestanding computers? If it's working, that's great. There's going to be many situations where you're either A, better off in the cloud, or B, better off with a server because of the way the apps work. So you may have to do it whether you like to or not. And uh, I think we'll continue on on the virtualization side at this point. So again, when you start looking at virtualization, you can see you've got VMware. There's three different versions. ESXi is free. For those of you that are 15 users or less, use the free version. It'll do everything you need. If you're between 50, 15 and maybe 70 or so users, Essentials probably has all the capability you need, like maybe even up to 100. If you're larger and have more complex needs, then you might use Enterprise. We don't think that for most of you, Zen Server or Hyper-V are that great of choices, although those are number two and three in our order. If you're going to do desktop virtualization, you can do that with VMware View or Citrix Zen De Desktop. And, you know, again, you can use those products today. They work well, but just make sure that you've got the right expertise to implement those. So I actually just put together this small example 
of a private cloud illustration. Everything redundant, dual firewalls, dual UPSs, dual switches, dual servers, redundant SAN, and a backup appliance. And this setup would handle about 50 users. So if you uh, choose to stay in-house on a private cloud, a small network that supports between 5 and 50 users will be about 55 to 65K. You can do the backwards math on a five-year ownership and see that you know, that's about 5,000 uh, a month or so. I think I've done my math. No, that's too high. Uh, uh, 10,000 a year is what I was trying to get out. About nine to 10,000 is where it typically lands. If you're a larger network, 50 to 200, Typically, you're going to get in for about 90 to 170 k, depending on your storage needs. And again, this is pretty scalable up or down. But plan a five-year life, and if you're going to do this work, think about supplementing your IT team with managed services, which typically uh, uh, cost less than another IT person. Now, we're not pro-cloud or anti-cloud. We're pro-solving your business need the best way possible. And I would suggest to you that, particularly for those of you who are public practice accountants, I always just remind you of the Patriot Act Section 215, which you'll see coming up in a little bit as a consideration as well. We know that vendors, Amazon being an example, are trying to do virtual desktops in the cloud. They're typically in the six to $900 per user range right now. And this Amazon Workspace is a fully managed desktop. It's a beautiful product. It runs very, very well. Uh, it's a Windows 7 type of experience and so forth. Everything's virtualized, but I'm going to stop on this slide. Because for many of you, the standard uh, offering will do correctly. Let's go on to the next one, which is $35 a user per month. But for some of you, you're going to have to have the high-end version, Performance Plus, which is $75 a user per month. So if you start running the math on this, you know, times 12, you realize that the annual cost can get pretty high here. If you're a public practice CPA, we don't see this as being ready for you. If you're an industry CPA, maybe. So again, over time, we'll see a lot more of this type of approach, but we don't think this is quite ready for prime time. All right, let's see. Let's talk a little bit of the um, infrastructure again. <laughs> excuse me, uh, trying to get the whole cookbook for you. There's a lot of cabling that is incorrectly done in businesses all over the country. And it doesn't matter if you're in the cloud or in-house, you need to have your cabling right. There is a new standard, CAT 8, which is still going through final uh, approval. So the most compatible standard with the new CAT 8 standard is called CAT 7A level F right now, or 7AF. Probably the most cost effective if you're smaller is the 6A. And again, you can see a little more leading in 6AF, 7, 7A, or 7AF. Uh, for wireless, you should note that there are high density access points that can be purchased if you've got a lot of users. And there's a new gigabit wireless standard, the 802.11ac or AD, which we are recommending. And the access points have been shipping now for about six months. So it may be time to get a faster wireless. But there is also another breakthrough in optical cabling that has happened. Now there's two vendors that have been uh, functioning in this area for a while. Uh, Intel with their MXC and Fujitsu Furukawa has a connector that will do 25 gig. But the key thing that I'd like for you to note from a quote from Jim Hayes in the Cabling and Installation and Maintenance uh, pro, uh, publication earlier this year, Jim basically says, look, it's time. You're going to have to pull out all that old copper cabling and recycle it. Copper prices are all time high, so it'll bring you a lot of money. And bottom line is today, in your office, you can cost effectively install optical cable. And that cutover happened about six months ago. So depending on where you are in the country, people may know how to install this or they may not. But today's optical cabling in-house is about a break even with copper. So note that rather than having you worry about all these cabling standards and what do I put in and so forth, I may push you a little more towards the optical cabling standard. Now here's Randy's rule. 
Many of you have CAT5E cable. You can find that out by looking at the side of the wires, and usually the cable type is written on there. If you've got a, a 3, a 5, or a 5E, you need to plan on replacing that cable sometime within the next year or two. It's actually causing you performance problems, but you just don't know it because what you've got is what you've got. And at that point, you could say, well, what should I put in? If you're small, 25 users or less, I'd probably say, well, let's, let's recommend the 6A. But if you're a little larger, we probably would have you stop and look at optical cabling. You should do this on any new building or any significant remodel. So I just want you to be aware of it. We think many people have not learned that fact yet. Next, um, yeah, I can repeat which cables to replace. That's CAT3, CAT5, or 5E. And there's a lot of vendors who are telling you, oh, 5E, that's just fine. Well, 5E is not just fine. And I can give you all sorts of documentation as to why I believe that's true. So 3, 5, or 5E. Now, on your switches, many of you are very small. I spoke to a firm this morning uh, that only had 12 users. And I concluded that they actually needed a layer 3 switch. And what happens is that these switches can be configured for higher performance and for security purposes. If you've got specialized areas of practice that are either, let's say, HIPAA or SEC compliancy based, you need to segment your networks and you have to have a layer 3 switch to get that done. For most of you up to about 400 users, the best brand to use here is HP. If you're larger, then I'd use Cisco. If you're maybe even 500 users or above, then I'd consider Cisco. But you need to set up what's known as switch trunking for your servers, and you have to define networks. And again, I don't want to be too technical on this. Um, Dell will try to sell switches here, but they don't have quite the same capability, and they're similar money. So you know, if you want to run slower uh, for the same money, then I, you can pick Dell, but they are far less capable switches than their HP or Cisco competitors in this category. Now, in terms of just general coverage, if you're running to the cloud or you're running with internet dependency, make sure that you have redundant comm lines from two different classes of providers, maybe a cable modem like a Cox or a Charter or you know some of those type of providers, and that you back it up with an alternate technology, a DSL or an MPLS or maybe even a cellular modem as a backup. But make sure you've got dual comm lines, and as much as you can, dual firewalls, and consider having cabling or wireless. So for some of your bigger networks, your firewalls can be sonic wall. An example on the high end might be the NSA uh, 3600 or the 4600. Uh, on your small networks, let's say 25 is probably the right number, 25 users or less, you could use the TZ215W. In your homes, I'd suggest you use something like the TZ105. We need to have more firewall protection than we typically have. You should not be using vendors' products like Netgear, uh, Linksys, uh, D-Link, Belkin. They are not strong enough to get the job done. At the low end, another good competitor is WatchGuard. At the high end, you've got Cisco, Fortinet, Checkpoint. But those five vendors pretty much cover where you should be with firewalls at this point. If you're doing communication lines, uh, notice that uh, I think this is the order to consider lines in. If you can get Metro Ethernet, bully for you. Uh, then MPLS, then maybe Verizon Fios, AT&T U-verse. But when you do this, make sure you ask the question, can I get video? Because if you can't get video, you're on copper U-verse instead of fiber optic U-verse. And there's a world of difference in performance and reliability. So your key question is, can I get video service also or TV video? Then you could use cable modems in kind of the lowest common denominator is DSL. See, many of you put in DSL because it was the best option you could get not that many years back. And notice, it's the worst of the options, in my opinion, today. So um, we also want you to consider maybe voice over IP. You can do this with hosted providers. I actually just did the research again on a question yesterday, so I have a little longer list that I can email you of what I think are good providers. But hosted ones might be 8x8 or Ring Central or Vantage Communications, to name three. And if you're going to do everything from one location, you can use a vendor like Formality or Shortel or Via or Cisco. All good 
voice over IP system. So if your phone system is getting some age on it, you're going to replace it. I think these might be seven of your best options in the marketplace right now. All right, well, we've only got a few minutes left together, but I'd like to clean up with just a little bit of software. Remember that if you put data in data centers, the uh, NSA Patriot Act Section 215 basically says that data can be requested without subpoena or notification. So you need to make sure that your uh, cloud provider is uh, indemnifying you or that you don't believe you have any confidential information that you're putting in the cloud hosting data centers. We know that there are really uh, vicious viruses like Zeus VM that are disguising themselves and slipping into your system. Barclays, for example, was attacked using uh, steganography, which basically hid attack code in a digital photo on a website, and they infected lots of systems that way. In general, we don't believe encryption is, uh, no, is no longer effective. We, we don't believe it's effective. And then number two, I thought it was fascinating that the VP of Internet Security from S Semantic uh, in early May said, hey, our product only catches about 45% of the uh, virus attacks, 55% get through. And we think the days of antivirus is coming to a close, and frankly, I agree. We've noticed for the last two years they're not working very well. So we'll talk a little bit about those. We're getting attacks from all over the globe. Uh, as it turns out, it used to be that most of these came from the uh, uh, European uh, Soviet bloc. But Indonesia is the top attacking country right now, and we're seeing a lot of attacks from China and from inside the United States itself. So it's pretty interesting to see how that's going. We think you need to use more sophisticated password management. I've listed these in kind of the preferred order from best to worst. Um, it could be debated that maybe Dashlane should be number three, but look at LastPass or RoboForm as being two good password uh, managers to consider. If you're looking at antivirus, we think GFI's Viper is the most effective uh, low overhead product right now. Uh, Bitdefender is another good product. If you want to use a cloud-based product, ABG's Cloud Care seems to work pretty well. There's a number of others we like, Trend Micro and so forth, but we don't believe that the endpoint protection from Symantec or McAfee are worth the money or very effective at their jobs right now. So in our last couple of minutes together, just a reminder that the end of life for Windows XP and Office 2003 has passed. So anything Windows XP and before or Office 2003 and before is no longer supported. That all ended on April 8th. The security patches were extended out to July 2015, giving them just a little breath of life, but you've got to get rid of all that old stuff. I can't exactly recommend you go to Windows 7 either because mainstream support for that ends on January 13th next year. So right now we're really thinking Windows 8.1 is your best migration position. Windows Server 2003, by the way, in life about a year from now, July 15th of 2015. We still believe that Office 2013 is a clear window. We think you should use open licensing with software assurance. There'll be a lot of marketing and effort trying to sell you Office 365, and we're not sure that's in many of your best interests, although it is the least cost way to get Microsoft Office products right now. There's a few other competitors you can look at, but if you're a CPA in public practice, you pretty much got to stick with Office. If you are a, an industry attendee, consider these other four. I've run the numbers for you on a nine-year period of Office 365 Pro Plus. That's the software-only version of Office 365 versus the licensing approach of Open License Plus Software Assurance on standard and professional Microsoft Office. So uh, the key thing to know is that with Office 365, if you stop paying, you don't own an Office license, and your Microsoft Office gets automatically remotely disabled. We're going to see this happen with Windows post the April 1 announcements of the uh, new Intune facilities for Microsoft as well. If you get a software audit letter, letter called a SAM letter, make sure you respond to it. Uh, they are very aggressively enforcing license compliance right now with very heavy fines, very heavy meaning 50000 for the occurrence plus 1000 uh, per user that you're out of compliance. All right, so we think maybe getting to Windows 8 
is a pretty good choice. You could choose Windows 7 and stay there. Windows 8 has a lot of cloud connectivity and very tight integration with Office 2013, better security, better performance, better support for multiple devices and multiple monitors. Touch makes this deal better, but it's not required. You need to make sure that you get the free upgrade for Windows 8 applied before August 15th because that is mandatory to get future upgrades. And we don't agree with Microsoft's strategy in that case, but that's the way it works. So I think we're ready for the last poll question in Div. I've probably got two or three slides I wouldn't mind speaking to. Okay, great. Now let me go ahead and open up the third poll question here. And you should see it up in just a moment. And the question is, who is responsible for computer or hardware maintenance in your office? And we have four options there. We're starting to see the votes come in. Okay, and the majority of people have voted at this point. We'll Jake, take just 10 more seconds here and keep the poll open. And again, remember, you have to vote to uh, get your CPE credit, so we want to give you enough time to get in on this. That's right. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and close the poll right now. And let's go ahead and share the results. And so, Randy, we see 47% of people say we contract maintenance services to an outside vendor here. Yep. And that would be a pretty normal answer, so uh, appreciate seeing that, particularly the eight-year-old grandson responders. <laughs> All right, so if you can give me control back, we'll clean her up here, Div. And I hope you're seeing a keep it clean slide at this point. Yes, we are. All right, so we know that many of you have issues on a daily basis uh, with your machines, and I think it's because your systems are in somewhat disarray. I've got a few utilities that I just want to make you aware of that could clean up your systems. See, we walk into to, uh, firms of all sizes and find boot times on computers north of a minute. And realistically, most of the time your boot time should be in the 25 to 30 second range. So if your boot times are longer than that, you've got a cleanliness problem on those boot systems and uh, probably in the system in general. So there is an inventory tool that is free called Bellarc Advisor. It evaluates your system, looks at the hardware and software and the license numbers and so forth. And it's a very nifty tool to do an inventory for lots of reasons, including insurance and business continuity disaster recovery. It will basically produce a report that looks pretty much like these reports in your materials to basically show you what's installed and, and so forth. There is another utility called CC Cleaner that does automated cleaning of your computer. It helps with your online privacy. It fixes a lot of system errors, freezes and crashes, and so forth. And the free version is limited but worthwhile running. There's a, uh, an additional product or a competitive product for the Mac called Pyroform, but we've included a few slides on CC Cleaner. And again, the free version helps the professional or professional plus can do a little bit more for you if you choose to do those. Um, Pyroform basically does the same thing for the Mac. So I wanted to include that. All right. And uh, Steve Gibson has a number of different tools uh, that he's had, including Spinrite. But there's a test tool called Shields Up, which will check your security and tell you if you've got issues. And it's a safe tool to use, but you may want to run it just in case you've got holes in your network security. Again, you can just uh, initiate Shields Up and run the test. And you can also look at your server identifications for mail and other things with the ID serve. So Steve has a couple of three tools that are all pretty darn good tools that you can look at. So if you look at Steve's freeware section, you can trust what he has published. So with that in mind, I know we we're supposed to finish it at, on the hour and I'm about three minutes past. We do appreciate you attending today and hopefully I've given you a few tech tips that you can uh, use. Uh, I know a number of you had asked questions that I was trying to handle as they occurred, but I'll ask the accountants for folks to send me some of those over and I'll try to respond to those directly. It's a pleasure to spend an hour with you. I hope I have given you a tip or two that can save you time and money. All the best. Good day. Randy, thank you so much for your time today and for your presentation. Um, 
just a reminder, Randy's complete deck of slides is also available on Accountants World's website. Simply click on the expert webinar link and you can go ahead and download the materials from there if you have not already done so. And so in closing, I just wanted to uh, share a couple of last things. Randy talk, talked about sharing documents. Accountants World has a solution for that as well, which I wanted to mention at this point. Cloud Cabinet is the name of the solution. It allows you to share documents securely over the cloud um, and offers uh, a series of features that you see in the middle there, customized folder structures, archiving emails when they're sent, uploading tax returns, and it's seamlessly integrated with all other Accountants World solutions as well. Right now, Cloud Cabinet is available with unlimited client portals for only $595 per year, and you can see that we are a previous winner of the Reader's Choice Awards from CPA Technology Advisor. Um, so I wanted to mention that, and finally, I wanted to thank you for attending. When you go ahead and close out of the webinar, you'll receive a brief go-to webinar survey. Please fill out that survey and submit that, and then, assuming you've been here for 15 minutes and answered your poll questions, you'll be all set to receive the CP. You should receive a follow-up email from us within the next 48 hours or so. Thanks again for attending, and we look forward to seeing you on July 9th for the next expert webinar from Accountants World.